had it all. Within this one village right here, we had it all and everybody could play all sports. And we used to run track as well. Before all this got here, this wasn't even here. This is what we should do at racing. We would race each other up and down here. I mean males and females. So we're gonna keep going. I remember the Thomases used to live there. The, uh, down to the Kaisers lived there. I remember the Harrises used to live here. Remember uh, Beanie and them lived there. Um, Tina, Charlita, Kimmy, Jimmy and them lived here. That's why if you ever see us on social media, we call each other neighbors. But we was like this, sitting on these steps as friends. And this is the number 25 right here. This is the apartment that I grew up in. I wish that we had the comfort of going in, ask individuals to do a tour through the house, but we're not going to do that. But this apartment right here taught me a lot, um, mentally, physically. Um, I got a lot of memories, great memories. And one thing about this here that people don't realize and getting into social media and kids today, we was growing up out here, we had no idea that this was special housing unit because parents didn't tell you these type things. They kept a child in a child's place. And we didn't know that we was less fortunate because we had everything, but the main thing we had, we had each other, especially when we was inside here. We grew up with love in here. Like every other family, we had issues just like other family, especially, and we would keep the issues in-house. And we made beef, argue, fuss and fight, but once you came out on the street, you stuck together. That's what family did. We're gonna take a walk. This is the blues, Shelly Blues. This was the playground. Even though it was a lot different, it's been modernized. Modernized. Basketball court again. The baseball field football field. We didn't have this track. I like how they did it out here. I'm glad they upgraded. Even though when we grew up, it was great for what we had and we utilized it. I mean, that's another thing with kids today with the social media. You don't see kids outside. This time we was growing up in the 70s, 80s, a basketball court would be filled. We would get up 8 a.m. in the hot, and it'd still be humid. We would play ball, leave, come back at 12, play ball, then come back by five or six, play ball again. But today, I think these kids have electronic, social media. They have so many things that's distracting them from their aim and their purpose. And you have a lot of them talking about, I want to go to the NBA, I want to go to the NFL, Major League Baseball. But if you're not putting in the time and the energy, how are you going to do it? It's, it's impossible. And then we, this was our, um, what you call that, that the kids have um, when they travel for basketball. Uh, What's the thing they call when we travel for basketball? Yeah, that was at AAU right there. But we grew up with fundamentals. We had the all around game. These kids today, it seemed like they're one dimensional. And what it goes back to, social media. They stuck with the electronics in their hands. Don't get me wrong, I'm a social media guy too. <laughs> but I, I can control mine. And I don't let it dictate my life or my present or my future. But it seemed like a lot of these kids do because it seemed like they get solidified, they get kudos for being on social media and doing certain things, not knowing that that's really not what social media is for. So you can walk back this way. And another thing, out here, we, we didn't have the gun violence like the kids have today. We gotta ask ourselves, what happened? How did all these guns or this gun mentality come into play today? That's the thing that, you know, we gotta we gotta ask each other. And you know, everybody had their different theories, different mindsets of why, but I think it's systematic. As we can see that certain parts of things that has happened through time, through the media, through um, the government, through um, CIA, FBI, certain things that came into our community that has destroyed our community. But one of the thing, main things that affect our community is 
single parent homes. We don't realize how important it is to grow up in a two parent home because you're getting that family structure, you're getting a foundation, you're getting a base. And if you don't have that within inside your home, and as we see statistics proves that you're more successful with a two parent home opposed to a one parent home. And believe me, we had a one parent home, our mother, um, but she did as good as she could do. Then you see, well, we can't even flip it. I've seen a lot of brothers and sisters that I know that had two parent homes and they wanted to live the life that we lived as in the, living in a single parent home. I'm not understanding, so I'm thinking sometime unlike a track and like rebel. So they weren't used to the life that we was living, so they wanted to come in the so-called our neighborhood, I don't like using the word hood, our neighborhood and be like us and act out like us. But then you gotta ask yourself what kind of psychological things or mental things that that individual may have been going through within their home. So you, you just never know. You can grow up in a two-parent home and you can fall short. And as we can see in a single parent home, a lot of people are successful. But what it is is it stays in the degree that you gotta grow and develop in order to overcome the obstacles that we see in our community today with these this gun violence. And just not even gun violence, just just violence of, alone. We can even talk about mental violence, how we display certain venom amongst each other. And we can even see it on social media, just we can type it. And sometimes they get misconstrued, but if you know who you're talking to, you can understand where the individual is coming from and their intentions, and you shouldn't take it a certain way. Back again, my name Nico Stratton. I grew up here, I'm a 25, Mr. Meadows. I'm gonna grow up in a single parent home. My mother had a boyfriend, probably when I was about eight, nine, 10, 11, then they separated. Um, and you know, we have a rich history um, with him as well. He was here, but he wasn't here. To me, the only thing that he taught us was how to play basketball, which um, I have reverence for him for this day for getting us on that path because he was a good basketball player. But other than that, just because a man is in the house don't mean he's in the house. He can be there physically, don't mean he's there for everything else. Um, grew up with my mother, she was a great mother. Um, I hear a lot of women today talk about strong black woman. That's what my mother was. She raised six of us. I'm next to the youngest. My brother Rico is the youngest. And she instilled certain values um, and morals within us that we utilize. But at a certain point of our life, when we came to a certain age, we kind of deferred, deterred from them. And we'll get into that later. But even through that process, you still keep a lot of your morals um, and ethics that, you know, my mother taught us. And um, my uncle and my aunt was very instrumental in my life as well. Um, my mother just was a strong, hardworking woman. I remember probably when I was like seventh, eighth grade, my mother was young. She had to drop out of school like a lot of our mother's grandparents um, had to do and fathers and to work. But when I was like in the eighth grade, probably like 1981, 82, I remember her going back to school to get her GED. And that meant a lot to me and to my um, brothers and sisters. And I remember helping her with her homework and she ended up getting her GED and that was great. And then probably like five years ago, at the age of probably 65, she went back to school and got a high school diploma. And we rewarded um, her um, with that as well. But I had older brothers and sisters as well. So we all kind of, they kind of took care of us, um, even though my mother instilled something in us as leaders um, and even Leaders go off course certain times in their life, and sometimes you got to come back, or certain circumstances or situations cause you to come back. But I can't say a bad word, um, ill word about my mother because she did the best that she could do. I remember times that my mother didn't have a car. We would walk all the way to the grocery store to Rodney Village and come back, but we never cried. Never seen my mother complain, never seen her pride because she knew what she had to do. She had a responsibility to do. And I think that is still certain strength um, and certain values within us as well. And my father, my father from Sussex County, Delaware. Um, I know my father, but I didn't know 
Um, you know, I hate to say it's like a lot of young black men and women today. You have a father, but is your father really there? And sometimes that affects you in certain parts of your life, but you don't know it until you get entwined within that part. And then somebody bring it to attention. Maybe you're doing this, you're doing that because you didn't have that father figure in your life. You wasn't taught to do this, you wasn't taught to do that. That's why I was saying earlier, um, a two-parent home is very important because a mother has her duty and responsibility, a father has his duty and responsibility. And a father is the one to give you that base, that structure, that foundation for the family, for the household. And the mother is the first, one of the first leader, teacher, and God, she the nurturer and the rear of the child. So when you have that chemistry and interdependence within a home, most likely it's gonna be successful or the child gonna be successful. But as time we know, we go off course. Me personally, um, I was always in the sports, didn't get in much trouble, um, got good grades in school. But like I said, a certain time in your life, you're trying to rear off, go off course for certain reasons. And everybody had their reasons, we'll speak on that as well. But I got good grades in school, um, did what I had to do in school. I remember one time, I got one pat on my life, ninth grade, and that taught me something. You'll never get enough. Don't act up in school. You know, playing, joking, turning into a fight. Both of us went down to the principal office, got paddled, and that paddle brought us together. And that's the same thing out here. It was a family unit. You have your friends, best friends, just friends. You will fight. But the next day, you speaking again, you cool again. We weren't running the house getting our mom at, or who had dads or going to get a knife or a gun. It's just you make up because that's the village and that's what we was taught out here. We had values, we had structure, and this is an important history and energy that we had out here that I wish everybody could experience, you know, within their, their lifetime. And right there is the community center that we used to have certain, do certain projects there, uh, free lunch and then the free lunch truck will come. Like I said, um, a lot of times, most everybody out here need help, but we didn't know why. And it wasn't important we didn't ask. We just know when the food truck come up, you go get that free lunch. And that's and that's what we did. We as kids, we stayed in a child's place. And our mothers and fathers didn't put us outside the pocket where we supposed to be. Only thing we had to worry about growing up as a kid is to be a kid. Enjoy life. Get good grades. These kids today, I think I see it a lot. I experienced a lot, you know, with friends, family I still have today. I think parents kind of put their children, give them too much information within their personal life, even within their relationships. And I think that's one of the things that has to change. The child, children end up getting entitlement issues, me, me issues. That's another thing growing up here. We had stages. We had like a pyramid of age, I think. Me and Rico, a year and a half apart. I got sister Donna, one year older than me. My brother Dino, one year older her. Then I got two sisters, like a five-year gap. So we had that family structure, that unit. And that's another thing I wanted to speak about. Um, I got a brother, my brother Dino. He passed away um, at the age of 26. He had cancer. Then I had my sister Donna. She passed away about three years ago. So, you know, that's definitely heartfelt. You know, our family still feel it to this day. Um, but we still pushing, getting over it. They grew up in this house with us, with a lot of love. And um, I want to introduce my brother, Rico Stratton, within the fold. He grew up in this household with us. Me and Rico always been like this, even to this day. Whenever you say Rico or you say Nico, you're going to think of each other. And we don't grew up getting called each other's name. Hey, Rico. I'd be like, hey. <laughs> and then after through the conversation, I am Nico, by the way, and they do the same thing to him because our names are so close. Not that we look alike, just our names are so close. But um, I just want Rico to give his experience of growing up here and what he thinks. He may have a whole different perspective of what I had growing up here, but I'm sure it's going to be similar. It may not be the same. <laughs> yeah, um, of course, I'm Enrico. I'm Nico's younger brother. I'm the youngest of the six. Um, growing up, you know, out here, it, like he said, it really taught us a lot. Um, actually, I'm going to say how we got out here was we um, 
had lost our home. And um, we had got into a house fire. And um, fortunately, but unfortunately, we were um, brought here to Mifflin Meadows. We've, like you said, we've always been a close net family. And being here was able to give us the tools that we needed to grow up, to be who we are today. And again, like you said, you know, even now, you know, even our friends that we grew up with, they still get us mixed up with names. My mom, she still called us Nico, <laughs> Rico, right. Dino. Um, and that's the thing, you know, um, most people have a history um, that some people are a legacy that some people will never know. Some people know, some people don't know. Our oldest brother, Dino, you know, um, for me, he was the greatest basketball player that I ever seen and still know. Um, some people um, have people in their life, as he said, you know, you look at them, um, they were there, but for them to be a father figure, you can't find um, what was needed as a child to grow up and say that this man taught me the values I needed in order to instill that manly quality in me that I needed or that we needed. Who was my examples growing up, to be honest with you, um, I can't say it was my uncles, my father. I have to say it was my brother Nico because he was um, who I looked up to as mentoring me and the structure that I wanted. Yeah, at times, you know, I got on his nerves, but that's what little brothers do, you know, but that always kept us in a view of knowing that there was a special bond between me and him. So, you know, yeah, growing up, he wouldn't let me play on the basketball court with him. But, you know, still, I mean, I could play football with him, but on the basketball court, you know, I wasn't the best basketball player, but I, I played. Um, but I'm thankful that I had older brothers that I could grow up with, and it wasn't um, a beat em up, bang em up relationship. I could probably say me and him probably only had one incident in our life. And um, I don't ever remember us having any more. And I'm thankful to that because I can't go through my life being bitter about this man right here because again, he's always been that example that allowed me to be the man that you see today, even in spirituality. Um, so I'm thankful to have a brother like this, to grow up in this environment. Um, again, like he said, in that community center, we were given 4-H. We was given the necessities that was needed for us to grow up to be um, good men. We were, we were taught in 4-H how to cook, how to sew, how to do other things inside of that building. Martial arts, we done everything that was needed inside of this place right here that gave us tools to grow up to be who we are today. So um, I'm, I'm very thankful for this place right here as being the, the institution that gave me the tools that was needed to be who I am today. So I pass it back to my brother. <clears throat> um, I appreciate that. So I have a question. Um, you mentioned earlier that Rico may have a different perspective and we see a lot of um, homes where they have multiple children. One child could be the most successful child and then the other child could be the drug addict, the alcoholic, and then they fail and they blame it on their families and the dynamics where you have the successful child versus the not so successful child. What are your thoughts about that? Well, let me speak on okay. um, <laughs> It's funny you say that because you're looking at two individuals within that family that never drank, did a drug. But we have four older siblings did drink and they dabbled here and there, different, you know, things. Um, but we didn't, like I said, everybody had their own experience. And then growing up, um, as you know, there's something called sibling rivalry. Um, sometimes certain family members feel though they're not getting the attention that they think they should get or that's wanted. Instead of looking within inside themselves and trying to find their happiness, um, they look for it within the parent or outside society and the community, so forth. But 
always been the type of guy that I hold myself accountable. If I did it, I did it. If I didn't, I didn't. It's just certain morals and principles that I stand on. And like I said, I seen it all around me, um, but I didn't let it succumb me because I was in the sports. And that was my mindset of that young black man having that vision of going to the NBA one day. So I'm on that basketball court 24 seven, me and my friends, Kylie Weatherspoon, Marisa, Oliver, we're, we was like this. And we would be out there playing one-on-one, -on -one, full court, blazing hot sun. And that's how we got our game up. So we saying we've been doing this since seven, eight years old. So by the time we got in junior high, seventh, eighth grade playing ball, we had so much chemistry and people were like, how y'all know how to play that good together? Because we had that chemistry. And I'm gonna give you an example. I'm gonna go off topic for a minute as you, I'm sure y'all saw the versus battle the other night. You can see when the lots had chemistry and you can see disarray in Dipset. Chemistry is everything is very important. You gotta have that chemistry and everything uh, within your life. And I see the chemistry that you have, you two have in the interdependence. And I love that about you two as well. What you wanna speak on, Rico? Um, like he said, you know, um, being the youngest two, we were able to see some of the um, lifestyles that we somewhat didn't want to repeat. Watching our older sibling growing up, some of the mistakes they made, some of the relationships they had, not saying all of them were bad, but we were able to see some of the things that we didn't want to find ourselves involved in growing up. So um, I'm thankful that we did have older siblings that we could experience and learn from. Um, yes, some of them, you know, um, had drug issues. Um, we lost our sister Donna, unfortunately, to drugs in some diameter of life. It wasn't all the calls, but she may have been able to be here with us a little longer if she could have just left that um, dependency on drugs alone. So. Um, that in itself um, was a, a, a growing that, you know, you can live life, you can want what's best for your family, but they have to want what's best for them. You know, we talked, you know, to and fro trying to pull her out of that life, but some people's destiny is what it is. So, you know, some people could be bitter and say, well, due to drugs. No, but sometimes it's not due to drugs all the time. It's due to decisions that we make or that our family make. Where we would fail is if we've never tried to pull her out of that life or our family members out of that life. Sometimes they hate for me and him to be around because they know they're going to get something. They're going to hear something because for us to be the youngest two, mostly everything falls on us to be the backbone of the family. So I'm thankful, again, that we were able to see certain things, experience certain things, because some people may have never experienced what we experienced growing up. Then you have some that's worse. But I'm thankful for mine. I'm not bitter. I'm not sorry about anything that happened in my life because it allowed me to be who I am today. Going back to your initial question, you think things in your household growing up um, can cause, can affect you in this day and time. Me personally, I think that sometimes you gotta find the problem, then take certain steps to, to correct and rectify the problem. A lot of us still taking the trauma and the hurt that we so-called experience growing up as kids. But as you become adult, I think you should begin to find certain resources, network and people to rectify your situation. A lot of us are 40s, 50s right now. Um, everybody can speak differently. Um, I don't wanna knock anybody, but me personally, like I said, I hold myself accountable. And I don't think that something that happened 30, 40 years ago should still be affecting you to the magnitude that it's affecting people in this day and time. I do a lot of social media, I do podcasts, I do um, speak engagements, and when you talk to people, they always wanna bring up their childhood. 
you're still living in your childhood. That's why you can't get past your childhood. And another thing within our community, we frown upon therapy and counseling. That's very important. Therapy and counseling. And what a lot of people try to do, they try to push it on their significant other, a brother, a sister. No, they're not professionals. You need to go get professional help from a professional. Put your pride, ego to the side, and go get help. That's very, very important. The first thing we say, I ain't going to counsel. I don't need to talk to nobody. And the same individual that say that is the one that need it. So I think that's very important. I think that's something that needs to be pushed within our community because it's frowned upon in our community and it shouldn't. And that's one of the reasons why our community is the way it is today is because we won't take the proper steps to fix ourselves. All right, this is the community center. And as you know, you go a lot of places today, the community center has been taken away. And this is very, very instrumental in a child's upbringing and coming up because you learn a lot of different things within these community centers. Um, like my brother Rico was speaking earlier, you learn to sew, you learn to cook, you learn to do this, you learn to do that. Even though our parent, my mother, taught us how to sew, cook, clean as well, but we also got it here, so we got a double dose. Teach you neatness and so forth. And like my brother Rico said, I got I got a story. But he said, all right, they also used to teach us karate. I remember the first day of karate practice. I go in here, we're stretching. I'm like, oh, that's all we gonna do? <laughs> I'm gonna throw some kicks, some hands or something. <laughs> so I walked out. <laughs> I walked out, I said, man, I don't do no stretching. But that's the thing, but I ain't not coming back. But that's one of the things as a child, you gotta have patience, you gotta be taught patience. And you got to listen to your instructor and to your elders because they have the wisdom. They have been there and they know and they know what they're doing. It was just a funny story um, I wanted to tell. But we used to have parties here. Um, we used to do a lot of things. And also, um, we have community events out here today. We come back here and try to relive the memories and bring everybody together collectively. All the old ones that was here and we invite the individuals that's currently here um, as well. So um, we haven't did it in the last two years because of COVID. Hopefully next year we can um, start doing it again. But that just shows you that the community and the love that we had here, because we all are willing to come back and relive them childhood memories and adult memories. But um, as we can see, we still got the pay phone here. That's been there forever. Um, you won't see many pay phones um, in places, but um, not much more. Like my brother said, you know, some things that was done in here that you're not gonna say on here. Stand on the infamous Kirkwood and Reed Street. This is the most infamous street in Delaware, in Dover. This right here. In the 80s, early 90s, or well, 70s, 80s, this was comparable to 125th Street in New York City. We had the Ritz Club here. We had the liquor store there. As we can see, gentrification is going on. Um, this was the pool hall and the square club. And this house right down here on the corner, you might can't see it. That house is when we moved from Governors, my mother moved here and my brother and my sister, and I moved to Capitol Park. But this house right here on Reed Street, this is the second infamous street. Then we can go to Queen Street and New Street, but I'm gonna say Kirkwood, Reed, and then New. Others may say different. I'm just going on my history. And if we go this way, we have the church. We have Gamma House down here. We have the Apollo down here. We have the basketball court down here. And mind you, the last tournament we had in 1989, we won the championship. Uh, and they ended it because the individuals kept walking up on the court. When they have a beef with an individual, they walk up on the court and they fight. But they fought, but they didn't go get the gun. In most instances. But um, as we can see, gentrification is going on. Um, they've got all new houses. But this was the infamous block where drugs, fighting, and just having fun was on this block. 
in the midst of all the drugs, things that was going on in this block, we still had fun. And one thing that we did, now I look at it, I don't know if it should be glorified, but we kept individuals that wasn't from Dover, from this area, out. As we get older, we look and we like, I. Right. it was kind of petty on that part, but what we call it was protecting our environment and protecting our investment, which was the money. And the other investment, no disrespect, but the women. We want to keep everything to ourselves. And that's what, that's what people do in villages, other countries is, you got to keep the money, keep the investment in the community, and you keep the women. And spoils of war is the booty, and that's the women and the money. But we're not going to speak on that. But um, we just left Miffin Meadows. Um, that's where the village that I grew up in, that's where all my morals, my values, in the village, the camaraderie, camaraderie, the love, everything that was instilled in me come from Miffin Meadows. Then we moved to Star Hill for a year. Then we moved over here to uh, Governor's my uh, sophomore year. Then after I graduated, we had a five, four, five bedroom house. My mom didn't need it anymore, so she got rid of the house, got the smaller house. And I moved to Capitol Park. I'm working, ready to go to school, go to college. In between, I'm like, damn, working. You know, back then, I'm on way 335. <laughs> I'm like, I need a car before I go. So, individual already trying to search certain seeds in my head, like, let's do this, let's do that, you know, illegal activity. And I can say selling drugs. And I'm like, nah, I'm not doing that. Mind you, growing up, I hated drug dealers. I hated them. And mind you, um, I'm sure he has spoke on this as well, but when we lived on governors, my mother used to be like, where your brother at? He should be in the house by now. Talk about Rico. Go around there in Kirkwood and get Rico off the street. <laughs> I'm like, come on, mom, I gotta go to school tomorrow, so I gotta come all the way around here, track him down, then take him to the house. <laughs> so mind you, if all that was still in the village, we come here, as you, I say, as you get older and you start to become a man, and you, there are certain necessities that you need in life, sometimes you cut corners to get it. And what I did was, everything that was instilled in me, I put that on the back burner, back burner to get something that I needed, which was a car. And as men, we're taught to be providers, and we got to get it by any means necessary, survival to fit it. I don't know why a lot of other people started doing what they're doing, but I know why I did it. I did it because one reason, and I said, I'm going to get this car and I'm going to stop. But as you go on, certain things start to set in. Greed sets in. Then you look and you start assessing the situation. You're like, this is easy. So I kept going on and on because personally, I didn't do it myself. I didn't sell it myself. I always other individuals to sell it for me. The moral of the story is left a village. Morals, value, love. Moved to governors. A whole different environment. Mind you, even on the street that we lived on at that time, it was a great street. I think we were the only black family on that street. From that block to block, corner to corner, it was just a mixed couple next door to us. It was a great block. But, left that block, start coming over here and hanging out, and you fall susceptible to the things that's going on in this environment. And after probably about four years of doing what I was doing, I ended up catching a case. Um, by no fault of my own, the only fault I'm taking responsibility is I shouldn't have been doing what I was doing, but I was set up by a close friend of mine, which I would not mention. Um, he's no longer a friend of mine. Um, he's not, he, I should, he's a disgrace, but I'm not gonna do that, you know. <laughs> That's another thing, I'm talking about accountability. When you get caught up, handle your own. And for everybody that's listening, when certain, something happened to you, don't implement others. Just because you have certain defects or weakness within your character, or you feel that you can't do certain things or certain time. You's out here reaping the benefits of getting this money, getting this illegal money, this atrocious life, and you gotta suffer the consequences. And that's another thing we gotta understand. Every dog has his day in his game. You gotta be able to suffer the consequences when it happens. So take accountability, and I'm huge on accountability. So I catch a case. I didn't catch it here, but my case in Milford. I was at the diner where I meet my people that come from down south. 
long story short, he brought the police to me, set it up, like a big thing on cops, take me to the feds, I get bail, fighting court, going through court, end up six months later, I get found guilty, and I got 10 years in the federal penitentiary. They gave me the most that they can give me. In the federal, penitentiary, federal system, they have guidelines. So you, it's somewhat called double jeopardy. You get punished for things that you did in the past, and you get punished for things that you did currently, or for that case, for that case. So in the midst of me being out on bail, they tried to give me a felonious charge. So I had to turn myself in and go to court. And they used that, even though I haven't been found guilty, they used that within my guidelines and my sentencing to sentence me because I had another open case while I was going to court. So they gave me, the judge gave me the most she could give me. And as we know, um, they have now rectified the federal guidelines to crack cocaine disparity because it was discriminatory and racist. But they have changed that now, which is good. It took them like 20, 25 years. And we did have a lot of um, big celebrity entertainers that got that law changed. And then when Barack Obama came in office, he signed the paperwork. When I'm saying, I think Barack Obama signed the paperwork. But long story short is, Moved from a village, moved to a nice, nice community. And you always got to be in a bad community in order to get caught up, to get caught up in certain situations. Sometimes it's just being a man or survival, or going to dorm, or just certain bad or poor decisions that you make. So in the process of me getting my 10 years, as we call it in the Fed, we call it Black Man University. And why we call it that is because you have so much resources so much information that you can acquire while you're there that you can better your life. I went back to school, I went back to college while I was there, uh, ran mentoring programs, um, I gained a lot of spirituality, went back, uh, I did a lot of continuing education programs, I did horticulture, uh, what you call it, uh, culinary arts, building trades. I utilized the time that they had given me. In these institutions, you got to have a renewal of the minds, as they say in some of the scriptures. Um, you got to change your mindset. When you change your mindset, everything else within this process will change. But the number one thing you have to change is your attitude. Attitude is manner and disposition which you regard something. Like getting up for work every morning. It's an attitude, it's a mindset. You got to get up. You know it's something you got to do, especially as a man, as a provider. You gotta get up and take care of your household. So it starts with your attitude, and then it starts, then your mindset. So going back to your incarceration, could you tell me like what you thought about the most while you were incarcerated? And then as well as how do you think your incarceration had an impact on your relationship with your children and your family? Well, I thought about the most was my family, uh, especially my children. What we don't realize is when we get incarcerated, it affects our family, especially our children, more than it affects us. Because they think that we're in harm's way. But as a man, it's called survival of the fittest. You're gonna survive. And as a man, I already knew that I could survive no matter what situation or predicament I was put in. But sometimes you hear certain stories within, on the streets of how certain things are. And sometimes it could be better, sometimes it could be worse, it could be less but I was in some of the hardest, most difficult spots in the country. But as long as you have that respect, you walk with respect and honor, you're good. That's what it's about. Anything in life is about respect. Um, and if you had issues, you handle them issues. But my thing is, is my children is the biggest thing in my family that I thought about the most um, and my mother because my mother still had that in her head that she was the cause of me doing what I was doing. And I was trying to tell her, as I said earlier, you raised me a certain way. It's just that I went off course with a certain defects that I had with inside myself because I wanted certain material things. Even though I thought at that time, I, this is what I had to do to get it, but I, all I do is have more patience and I could have still got it. It took a little more time. I think it started with, personally, I think we need to, Eradicate, shut down the whole music industry with rap music. 
me personally, I think rap music is what's hurting our family. You have a lot of these kids out here that follow this, emulate and assimilate what's going on on TV and this rap music. You got kids and even adults, you can't even do schoolwork. You can't even remember schoolwork, but you can remember a rap rhyme or R&B song. I'm the opposite. I can't remember a rap song or R&B song in my life, but I can remember something in that book. I, I don't get it. it. It's just a certain mentality. So I think it starts with the rap music, but it also starts at home. And it's not, we always want to blame the parent. I'm going to use myself for example. I grew up in a single, house, single household. My mom did great, but I made the decision that I made on my own. But the majority of individuals don't have my story. But to them individuals is, streets don't love you. Streets don't love nobody. Because when you fall, you out here selling these keys, you selling these drugs, when you fall, two more people are gonna pick up where you left. Then you're gonna go into penitentiary, collect all this trauma, come home, want to get revenge, like she said on everybody, want to go back in the street, want to keep up with the Joneses. It's not about that. I think we got so much gun violence. Today is we got gangs. I think gangs is a big part of the problem we have today. And a lot of people say they join gangs because of the love, the brotherhood, the camaraderie that they get. Well, you got to find that love inside yourself first before you go in a gang, something that's, to me, which is negative. A lot of people say that it's, it's a positive thing. No, a positive thing, you go join a fraternity. Go join a religion organization or your local NCO club or your, your local Elks or a square club. That's positive. To me, joining gangs isn't. Because as we know, to get in a gang, you got to do something negative to get in the gang. And then when you try to get out of the gang, certain consequences that you got to be held accountable on when you want to lead a gang. So why would you want to be a part of that? And plus you see all, you see people dying every day in gangs. So why would you want to be a part of it? You need love that back. But that's where we come in as mentors, community groups, police organizations, and other organizations come in and get out of that community, walk the beat, and talk to these kids. Like we said, we can't reach them all. As long as we get that one, we're good. It's a tough job. I, we have a lot of people that are optimistic about what's going on. We got a tough job. And all the individuals that want to, that's looking at this, and you calling yourself an OG out here, you're an OG, I want to see you on these streets where I see all these other individuals out here that don't call themselves OGs trying to uplift the youth. I want you to do that. I'm calling out everybody. All right, we're in front of Bible Way Church, right here, Stokel Church. This church been here before I was living. And back in the day when all the action that was going on, on this block here, on Sundays you didn't see any of that because they showed respect to the church. They showed that respect. And that's one thing that, you know, we did. So I guess everybody should be on this block morning, noon, and night, I guess they took rest on the seventh day as well. But um, I wanna speak on other organizations, meaning the churches, um, other organizations, temples, mosques, um, private organizations, Elks, NCO, fraternities, sororities, other community events. We gotta come together as a unit that's the only way we're going to save our children. Sometimes ego and pride um, destroys our community. We can go back to the Cain and Abel situation. The jealousy, envy. We got to get this out of our mindset. We got to get this hierarchy out of our mindset when it comes to uplifting our community. These young brothers and sisters that's running these streets, killing, stabbing each other, they don't care about, nothing about that hierarchy. The attitude you have, they just need somebody there to save them. So we, as organizations, need to come together and get in the street. We all can sit behind a restroom, or we all can sit behind a pulpit and talk. But if you ain't out here on these streets putting in action, you held accountable just like everybody else. You need to be held accountable. If you say you out here for the people, all your religious leaders, organizations, prophets, 
Apostles, wise men that was in these books that we all follow, they was on the street. They didn't just stay in the temples and the churches. They was on the street out helping the people. And as I always go back to, it starts at home, the family unit, the structure. Then it goes to the community. And that's what we got to get back. We got to get back to community, togetherness, that village that we used to have in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And a lot of us don't even know the history of the 50s, 60s, 70s before the destruction that's being caused now. We got to get back to that concept. And we definitely have, everybody had these certain theories, understand of integration. But truthfully, before integration, we were still together as a community. We still had 80% two-parent homes and marriages. Not saying integration wasn't a bad thing or wasn't a good thing. But what I am saying is that we got to go back and study that family structure and take them jewels from there and implement them today. We, we can't go back and do away with um, integration. We can't go back to segregation. But what we can do is go back and study that and how we had our own black businesses, farms, grocery stores, mom and pop stores, banks. We need to go back to that. But we can't get back there until we get this unity amongst ourselves. And we got to continue to work on ourselves. And our attitude, as I always say, everything starts with our attitude, how we view things. Still on Kirkwood, we're just on the other end by the basketball court. My favorite sport, most black people favorite sport. Got a lot of memories on this court here. This court here playing this game kept a lot of us out of trouble and brought a lot of unity and competitiveness. And that's what I think people don't realize with men. I wonder why men are so challenging because we're so competitive as a people and that should be good because everybody, you know about the hierarchy, everybody want to be that main guy, that main girl. You want to be the best of the best of what you do. People want it for certain reasons, recognition or self-love. But for me, what it does is it boosts your self-esteem. And a lot of us, as black people, have low self-esteem for certain reasons. Like I said, be accountable, figure out what your problems are, what you lack, seek help, seek assistance. I'm always gonna teach that and I preach that all the time to my friends and family. Accountability, be accountable. If something happened to you, look inside yourself first and ask what part did I play, rectify that and then check the other avenues, but always start with self. And this right here held all of us accountable. This would kept a lot of us out of trouble, kept a lot of us busy. Like I said earlier, we was out Mifflin Meadows. That court was empty, seeing two kids out there playing. Like I said, when we was young, this was our outlet. Whatever was going on at home and outside world, once you get in between these lines, it was 94 feet, everything else was irrelevant. What you want to do is be a man and annihilate your opponent. We wasn't friends when we got on. The only friends you had were the other four people that was playing with you. And that's just the competitive nature within men. And as we should be. But like I said earlier, this basketball court right here, 1989, we won the last championship here. And one of the reasons why they stopped having it is because we have individuals that had the same mentality as individuals do today. Fighting, gun violence, and stabbing. As men, we always say there's nothing wrong with fighting. But when we start talking about going back to gun violence, that's the problem. And who are we killing? We killing each other. But we got these other individuals, other people out here oppressing us. We ain't going out and kill them, but we want to kill somebody that look like us. We got to change that mentality. Like I said, this right here saved a lot of us. On this court right here, on the basketball court, you got the sale, you got the meadows, you got all the capital green, you got other places. This is what brought us together. This is what brought unity right here. And this is what we missing. Things like this, going back to this. These kids should be out here balling right now. You have your dream of going to NBA, doing this and that. As we know, yeah, right, we can play ball, we can go to college. You might not go to NBA, but you can use those same skills to get that scholarship. So you can have a profession and utilize that and it becomes successful. You don't have to make the NBA. And that's another thing we want to talk about. Um, I was just 
at a community event in Wilmington yesterday, Prices Park, put the guns down, stop the violence, gun violence. And there's a brother out there. He was great in basketball high school, went to college, was great. He had a vision of going to the NBA. He didn't make the draft. When he didn't make the draft, didn't go to the NBA, he went on this downward spot. I don't like to hear stories like this. So I asked myself, what happened to that brother? Who wasn't in that brother's corner to keep motivating him after he didn't make it to the NBA? That's another thing we got to talk about. And that's a bad thing, but the brother's about 40 now. He still haven't rectified it. And I was like, but you never know what an interview is going through. And brothers like that, you got to lend them a helping hand. You got to send them assistance. You got to point them in the right direction. But going back to this, we had many battles out here. Many battles. Many fun nights on this street right here. You talk about Dory, you talk about these streets. Certain names ring, like the Strattons. Not that it's a good or bad thing, but we all know for good or bad. But you, have, you talk about the Strattons, you talk about the Joneses, you talk about the Harrises, you talk about the Tolsons, you talk about the Ingrams. These are names that was out here on these streets doing good, doing bad. We all balled together. We all grew up Capitol Green together on weekends and holidays. But I see a lot of these brothers that was out here in the streets are doing great right now. A lot of them are doing great. And that's what I like to see. And I wish we all could have a, a reunion, get together. We all may have disunity back then. We had situation, our problems, but today, we put that to the side as 50 some year old grown men that had beefs when we was 18, 19, 20 years old, put that to the side. And these are the messages why I say we need the OGs to come out and get this message to the youth. They can catch it before it's too late. A lot of it was too late for a lot of us. A lot of us in Smyrna, in the penitentiary, or a lot of us in the feds doing life, doing 20, 30 years. But individuals like us that call ourselves OGs, we got to hold ourselves accountable and come out here and try to help these help this youth. And I see some of them brothers are definitely doing um, good things within the community. And a lot of them doing good just within their family, within their structure. And that's good as well. And give a shout out to my man, Boog, oldest of the Joneses, passed away a couple years ago, dear to my heart. Um, Reggie Hannon, another one. Um, he was the first case in Delaware of police brutality, getting killed in the hands of the Dover PD. Um, I don't know the whole story. I just wanted to put it out there, make people aware of it. But that's what we fight now as a whole, police brutality, accountability for the police. Um, and another thing, in this day and time, we need to create that bond with the, your local police department. As we're here in Dover, we need to have that bond and understanding with them so when they do come up on the scene, they coming up with the right attitude and the right mindset. They not coming up with that fear that had been posed in them that to come up and just automatically look at the person that's being apprehended as a bad individual just because of their skin color or maybe because he may have done something wrong. That's the mindset we gotta get out. We gotta have an understanding with our local authorities, local police, so we can have a proper understanding and build and we got to secure our own community as well. We just had a Juneteenth event, um, June 19th. We secured our own community. We secured our own premises because if something happened, we know how to handle our young brothers. If they don't have the proper training or understand our community, how are they going to handle the young brothers and sisters? So they need training and they need courses on how to handle young black men and women. Cause they don't, a lot of times they don't know what we went through and what we've been through. But this block here will be infamous, the most famous block in Delaware and Dover. Like I said, we got the basketball court. We had our own world famous Apollo, yeah, New York City. We had our own Apollo here too. All of us getting in Apollo at a young age, don't even supposed to be in there. We had the gamble house, which I never gambled, so I've never been in there. Then we had our Ritz. We had our you gotta deal with? That's another persuasion. That's another, come on. 
like that was that was unnecessary. <laughs> but um, going back to the infamous Kirkwood Street, got a lot of love. Yeah, for this street. Um, I want to talk about what brought me into the life of crime and what brings me to the life now. I'm gonna do it in a short passage. Um, of course, like my brother um, explained, and I explained in earlier videos that um, our mother did everything she could for us as young men. But sometimes you reach a certain age, you no longer want your mother to continually to keep taking care of you. My mother had six children. And as we were growing up, I used to always say, you know, I'm tired of my mother struggling or my mother working so hard to take care of us. So me, I used to sneak out, I used to see the guys, I used to see how they was making that money and I kept my eye on them. So as I got old enough to, you know, find my way in the streets, I, I hooked up with certain individuals and it allowed me to no longer have to look upon my mother to take care of me, but I would take care of myself. So in taking care of myself, I influenced those around me and I turned them on to that same lifestyle that allowed me to be self-sufficient. And that was out here in the streets, you know, Kirkwood Street, Reed Street, Governors. We used to use these streets as means of employment because at that time, you know, yeah, some of us worked, but then you had some of us that we just didn't, you know, I tried capital cleaners, it wasn't for me. So when I was able to find a resource to make that money, these streets was my life. These streets is where I got my money. But again, like I said before, at a time, I reached a certain level and I said, I didn't want to do this no more. So when I found myself not wanting to do it anymore, I was already on my journey and my road to prison. So in me going to prison, it was able to, I was able to further acknowledge myself into what I say I believed and what I wanted out of life. And in doing so, I was able to come home and put myself in a position to be able to find myself on a new road and not finding myself hanging with those same individuals that um, could have led me back into that life. Because I was an introduced, you know, um, individuals wanted me to come around them. They wanted me to hang out with them, but I didn't want that because I had a partner with me that wasn't gonna allow that. So what I did was me finding myself wanting to stay on the right path, I involved myself with certain groups, certain organizations that will allow me to continually be the man that I am. So that's why when we have different events or different things going on, I'm always wanting to be a part of it, not to be seen, but because I remember the days when I was out here being self-destructive, when I was out here being destructive and poisoned in the streets. So now I knew that I wanted to come back into society and give them a new version of me. So we as men that was out here in the 80s, in the early 90s, we have to take responsibility for the mess that we caused. So we can't look for somebody to come outside of this Dover area, these, these four blocks, and say they know what's needed to bring change into the community. Because they can't do that because they don't live inside the community. So they don't know what went on. They don't know what go on. They only know what they're told. So as we, as individuals that, again, live that life, come back into the community, we can see further down the road than what these individuals see today because we've been there we've done that so it's not that we're going to go back to them and say look young buck you don't need to do this because we did nah, that's not how you do it you go into the community you find those individuals and you ask them what causes them to find themselves in the situation they in now wanting to hustle wanting to do whatever and then you try to implement within them to see something different than what they see because we didn't have individuals in the community to do that for us so now it's our responsibility for what we lacked back then to bring it back into the community to give it back to the children 
so that or those young individuals that's out in the street so that they can have a better chance other than going into the prison to find out that they can do something greater than what they've done or what they can do so um that's why um again you know my brother uh, mentioned 302 um community organization that we're a part of um of course you know there are some other um organizations um i used to be in um gentlemen uh, men of value um there's some other organizations that's still functioning that are still working with the youth and until we have a desire and an understanding that the youth is where we need to be in order to bring about the change that's needed in our community we're going to continually to see a high rate of incarceration because that's the plan of the enemy because prison is on the stock exchange a lot of your prisons and institutions are private institutions that's earned that's owned by certain bankers or certain organizations that want to make sure that the prisons are full and the only way they're going to be full is they have to have individuals that they don't think that's educated or have enough value within themselves to find themselves running away from the prison instead of running into the prison so the one of the tricks that they're using now is these vaccines the vaccines a lot of people don't know that they have mind altering stimulants in these vaccines that will allow them to control you and you not even knowing why you being controlled or why you see people now all of a sudden shootings have gone up going up ever since the vaccines have been implemented into the communities and being forced upon our people in the community look at the gun rate of violence that has been that has gone up and as you see a lot of them aren't really trying to kill the individuals that they kill are shooting because they shooting them in the leg so if you pulling a gun on somebody and you shooting them in the leg are you really are you really thinking with a rational mind or are you thinking with an irrational mind so we have to understand that until we can get a grip on our community somebody else is always going to have control over our community again the honorable miss lewis farcon said he coined a phrase he said the man that give you your education know the diameter of your thinking or the circumference of your activity so if we continually to allow someone else to come into the community and educate our children and we not educating them or we not giving them to think outside of the box or think outside of that school system then they're going to continually to work within that system or that you know the parameters of what that education or that system that is designed to keep them only to a certain level because when they are in school they aren't taught how to go into these higher schools of learning to do something for self they aren't giving them shop education that we used to get when we was there motor shop and all these things that would make us independent of going into college to work for somebody else so i'm thankful that you know my time again in prison gave me an opportunity to come back out and see with a different eye that i seen before i went in you know the honorable Mr. lord farcon has blessed me to be able to understand my life as a man and my value as a man so why would i want to go back into the streets and push drugs upon my people when i see the value of my people as it says when i was a child i thought as a child but when i became a man i put away childish things and i conducted myself as a man so now that's what you see today i'm no longer that young brother or that young boy or that young man that was out in the streets hustling selling drugs and doing what he was doing I'm now out in the streets trying to uplift my community and be a successful individual in my community. Thank you. Yeah, I know we talked earlier about um, unity within the community, within organizations. I want to give a shout out to the community organizations that are doing something, like the Q's. Talk about um, Tracy Palmer's ministry, NEO, and other organizations, COC, which is the one that we're part of. We want to give kudos to them. We do have people out here being on the ground. We got to, well, I can't say that because this won't be out by then. But look on social media. Always look on my page. I'm always promoting unity amongst our people, unity events.
from here, south, north. Even though I live up north, I'm down here beating the ground where I'm from in the communities that I come from. That's right. I'm giving back to what I destroyed or helped destroy. Now I'm trying to give back. Um, I also attend community events up north. Like I said, just look at my page. You always see the community, look at Rico's, look at other And another thing is, I want to give a lot of love and respect to this brother here, my little brother. Not just saying because he's my little brother. You ever on New Street, on Saturdays for the last 20 years, you would see this brother on the street. Talking to the youth, selling his product, showing an example of how we can be and how when you go into the penal system, and you can come out and you can make a change. You see that, you see the example. People always say to me, I seen your brother on the corner, I seen your brother on the corner. Uh, that's great, because they're the same corners that we used to be on destroyed, but this brother been on there for 20 years and trying to rectify what happened back then. So I just want to get him his flowers, in case nobody else did. And I keep saying all these individuals getting community wars and events, and nobody came, this brother, and this is the first brother that I seen out here putting in this work but I'm not understanding, but I'm just telling my truth and what I see. So much respect to my brother. We're gonna close this out. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, some of what he was saying, I can understand why I don't get the awards and the accolades because my mindset is not a go along, get along nigga. My mindset is not to get um, the spotlight or to be seen um, among individuals of stature. I want to be among those that you don't want to see, those that you don't want to be a part of. Those are the individuals that is going to make the difference in our communities. So that's why, as my brother said, they may never give me what they give other individuals because that's not what I work for. That's not the reason why I do it. I do it because I was a part of that reckoning that was going on in our community. So that's, you know, why they will never or may never give me the accolades they give somebody else because that's not what I seek. I seek the salvation of our people. Thank you. My name is Nico Stratton from Dover, Delaware, but I reside in Bear, Delaware. Um, part organization called the COC, Community Outreach Committee. Um, you may see our hashtag in Dover, COC or COC 302, that's us. We're also known as the group with the red shirts. Um, you might see that on Facebook or people who don't know our name, that's what they um, call us, that's what they relate us by. Um, we're just an organization that came together about two years ago just to help our community. It started out with feeding the homeless for Thanksgiving from one idea from one individual and it turned into something, you know, big, prosperous, and we've been pretty much successful for the last two years. Um, we started out with feeding the homeless at um, our location, which is the Boulevard, located in Dover, Delaware. Um, what we did was we fed the homeless, we actually had giveaways to the homeless, like clothing, um, coats, we had toy drives, we had presents for the children, for the adults, and what we did was we connected with another organization called Code Purple. We partnered with them um, and used some of their people to help us, and we used their transportation to go in areas in Dover where the homeless reside and pick them up and bring them to the boulevard. So our goal was to cater to them to that day, for that day, because they don't get catered to. You know, people will walk by them on the street like they're nobody, and but nobody understands them. And people look at them as less than, but we in our community, our organization, we look at them as that equal as anybody else. It's just that certain obstacles or situations or traumatic situations that happen within their life that cause them to go that way. And a lot of us is a step away from that as well. And a lot of that um, isn't always economic or financial. It's some of us, you know, mental health. 
Um, and we don't talk about that enough in our community. Um, so what we did was we would pick them up, drop them off, bring them inside, we would sit them down, and we would go to them and ask them, tell them what was on the menu, we would go and get it for them. They didn't have to stand in line like when they go to other places and have to get their own food, sit down, do this and do that. We had individuals to take care of their every dying need they had for that day. We wanted them to feel special because they don't get that often. So we fed them. Um, we even had little children um, out there helping as well because um, we got to teach the children from young to have some kind of empathy, sympathy, and to give back to our community. Um, then they give them a sense of self as well. So we came to them that day with food. Um, we even gave them shelter. We gave them clothing. We gave them toys. We gave them shoes. Um, and we even had a barber out back that would even cut their hair if they wanted to get their hair cut. So at the end of the day, that was so successful, um, we ended up saying, all right, let's do this again for Christmas. We ended up doing it again for Christmas. It was successful again. And then we ended up doing a Black History event, um, you know, thereby in the community. Um, the homeless wasn't part of that, but we just put that in our um, things to do as an organization on a yearly basis. But then after that, um, COVID hit. But then, as COVID was going on, we masked up and we were still out in our community and practicing safety because we know they still needed us. Um, plus, we partnered with other organizations, um, Code Purple and Tracy Palmer Ministry, Q's and other organizations, whoever need us to come out and um, help them, assist them in any way. They call um, or get in contact with one of the members of our organization, and we all hands on deck. All right, so um, tell me your thoughts and how you feel about what it's going to take and some provisions and things that can be put into place. How can we as a unit, as a whole, come together to make things better in our communities, in the black communities? Well, what I think it's going to take in the black community to help the black community is the black community. And I think it starts within the household. We got to get back to two parent households. Because the mother and the father each have a very dynamic role to play with rearing and bringing up the children. As we know, the father is there as the primary. Well, not in this day and time. Father's known as the provider. He's not only a financial provider, he's also a spiritual, um, spiritual. He provides the foundation for the family, a lot of the principles for the family, a lot of the discipline for the family, and mostly he's there to guide the male with the little boys within the family. And as we know, the mother is there as the first leader, teacher, and guide of the child or of the children. She has to uphold her responsibilities and duties as well as the man do. And one of the things they have to do is balance that feminine and masculine energy where it connects correctly and you have synergy within the family where one does it and balance the other. And I think um, correcting that community starts at home. Because when it starts at home, you correct that and you try to rear your children up to the best of your ability. Even though we know we have children that was on a straight and narrow, straight path, as myself. But once you become a man, or you think you're a man, you come age, sometimes you rear to your left. But for the most part, it's just that coming up and teaching this, these young boys and these young girls or ladies how to be respectful citizens. And when you have that, and you teach them certain ethics and values and morals within the home, they're supposed to take that out in the community and exercise the same actions and intentions in the community. And once we get back to that, that's the start of building and rectifying our community. Inside the home, the family, 
brought out the community, then it's our nation. This has been that way from the beginning of time. It starts at home. Then it goes into community with morals and values, ethics, and then it goes to the community. And then it goes to the nation. Until we get back to that and then start securing our own community so we don't have individuals coming in our community and doing what they're doing in our community with the things that's going on today, you know, the police shootings or even the mistreatment of certain individuals in our communities. If we protect our own community and we have respect for our elders in our own community, we don't have to call them to come in our community and for them things to happen. So we got to get back to that, having that respect and honor in our community for the elders. It seemed like that has one left within our community. And that's the foundation of our community. So I, I heard two things I heard you say. The first one was about having two parent homes. Um, how do we make that possible? Do you think that's a possible thing? Because now, um, the black men seem to have become scarce when it comes to um, being in the black household. And then another thing was you were mentioning other people coming into our communities and um, doing the things that they do, the police brutality and all of that. But what about the killings, the shootings, and all of the things that's going on within our communities that needs to be addressed? What the first part again? The first part was regarding having the two parent homes, do you think that's possible? How do we how do we work to get him back to that? Oh and sometimes we gotta look outside our community, outside our certain dynamic, our cipher. We don't realize that if we look outside our immediate circumference, there is a lot of two parent homes. But what only what we see is that there's none in our community where all the action is happening. So I understand um, exactly what you're saying, but just to um, touch on that point. But that's a good question. Um, since we have one parent homes now, which is the mothers, I think it's gonna start with the mothers that's raising the children or the single fathers that's raising the boys and girls. We got to instill in their head old traditions or old ways, meaning that look for a man at a certain age, look for a woman at a certain age, and begin to teach them when they get 14, 15. Sometimes we wait too late when they 17, 18. No, they're already in the world, they're of the world by then. You got to teach them femininity and masculinity at these ages, 14, 15 years old. Believe it or not, you got certain countries, people in other countries, they started five, six years old teaching their children. But it goes back to looking here in the West, we so far off from the East, the traditional things that sometimes we're not or afraid to look in the East for certain information. But we know that not a lot of the religions and spirituality that we choose to follow, we seek that from the East but we can't seek what's good for our household, what's for our community in the East. So it's all it's all in the mindset. Like I spoke last week on, sometimes we go on vacation, you know, in other countries, and we only there on vacation. But on vacation, we also can double down when trying to learn their culture and learn things about them. And that's some things that um, I don't think we do. Second part. And then, um, you know, addressing the things that goes on in the black community um, versus the police brutality, but we also have a lot of black on black crimes so, and a lot of gun violence and things going on amongst each other, jealousy, envy, all that stuff, families, you know, coming against each other and sort of working together. Um, you know, how do we combat against that? Because um, we can't address the things that are going on outside of the community and the people coming in when there's a lot going in on inside of the community. I think how we get to rectify that is, I spoke on that last week as well, with the elders, with the so-called OGs of the community. We got to get back to the community where the man was the leader, the teacher, and the guide, where he's got to step up and show his responsibility for what he was born to be 
something to do. I think it starts with the men. But as we know, we have a lot of women within the community, like I said. So we got to reach out to the women and make them a part of this process as well because they are the ones that's leading the children today. So me personally, I think we got to put feet to the ground, go into communities, like we said earlier, instead of a neutral site. Neutral sites are good for certain things, but we got to go into the community and talk to the kids. And first, what I think we have to do, go to the elders. And the elders got to hold everybody in that community to a certain standard. And I think that's where it starts. Like you said, we, we can't look outside our community um, until we look within our community, because that's where it starts. And if we are rearing these young ladies and brothers up the right way, then we should be fine. Until we do that, we continue to have the same um, tragedy that we have in our community. And we also got to change the mindset of the children. We got to change what they're listening to, what they're looking at, who they're hanging out with. And it's definitely a difficult job dealing with these kids today because they have so much freedom. Technology, internet, it's the kind of hurt us in a way. Um, it's supposed to be the information age where we learn more, but it seems like with this technology information, we digress and we go backwards. So somehow we gotta change that and find intricate ways to do that.